perspective, I think it's really important that we're constantly raising awareness for um, the community uh, because FND is such a common condition and yet still so few people know very much about it. I'm dismayed every time I hear that story that someone says that my GP has never heard of this or the nurse told me to get up. Um, but we're very passionate about getting some research up and running in this space because we're quite shocked with how little work's been done relative to other areas. And happy to just engage in deep conversation about FND and, and a daily life of FND as well. We because FND is such a common condition and yet still so few people know very much about it. I guess I've devoted uh, the past uh, 15 odd years, maybe a bit more, to trying to raise awareness and develop treatments for people with functional neurological disorders. My background is in clinical neuropsychology and I'm a professor of clinical neuropsychology at Melbourne University but I've also practiced for over 30 years. My beginnings uh, were in the field of epilepsy, actually, and I worked at the Austin Hospital in their comprehensive epilepsy program for many years and established a rehabilitation program for patients who were coming through and having epilepsy surgery. But what we found, um, and certainly what I found in working in that unit, that there were many people coming through uh, who weren't eligible for surgery, and there wasn't any services for those people. And many of those people had functional seizures. And so that's really where my interest and passion for promoting services for people with functional neurological disorders began. And from there, I set about uh, setting up a community-based clinic and really wanting to train uh, psychologists in therapeutic techniques so the clinic takes a number of registrars who come out of the master's clinical training program every year and they spend uh, three years and hopefully stay on and continue to work in the clinic. Um, and in that way, we've been able to expand our services and broaden our reach. Uh, but we also really greatly value working with uh, neuropsychiatry, and neurology and all our other colleagues in other disciplines because it does require a multidisciplinary treatment approach. So we're very embedded and connected and um, in the work that we do. Fabulous, thank you for introducing yourself and the great work that you're doing. Uh, Travis, could you introduce yourself to our audience? So, um, Travis Cruikshank, uh, I'm from Edith Cowan University and the, and the Parent Institute um, in Perth, Western Australia. Um, we, I suppose, we're in our infancy, our team in the F&D space. Um, I'm part of the, the SPIN research program, which is systematic profiling in neurological conditions. And, and we look at clinical, biological and lifestyle changes in people living with various neurological conditions and, and um Using that information, we try to devise some non-pharmaceutical treatment strategies for, you know, these conditions. A lot of my background has actually been in Huntington's disease, um, which is a rare neurodegenerative uh, disease. And um, and while quite dissimilar in, in, in many aspects, they are similar, some, you know, F&D and Huntington's disease, because people, you know, can experience a whole diversity of clinical issues. And um, for a long period of time, there weren't very many effective treatments so, you know, I, I think that um, there's a lot of positives to take out of that because Huntington's disease has advanced so significantly in the last five years in terms of treatments. And I suppose even though we're new to the field in F&D, 
our team, you know, comprises a whole bunch of specialists in Alzheimer's disease, you know, Huntington's disease, Parkinson's and alike. So we're trying to combine all these areas of expertise into, into one program and, and hopefully we can leverage that. And with F and D, it's it's very new to us and um we're we're constantly learning and, and we're meeting new people. Um, but we're very passionate about getting some research up and running in this space because we're quite shocked with how little work's being done relative to other areas. And thanks very much for having me along. I, I agree with both of the other speakers. It's a really important um, enterprise to raise awareness about FND. And um, and I'm surprised how unaware people are uh, frequently when you speak to them, other clinicians, other patients and lay members. And I think that um, and the lack of clinical services and relative lack of research knowledge uh, was what really struck me uh, when I started working in the epilepsy space, a bit like Sarah. Um, I'm a psychiatrist by background, and I've done research in psychosis and neuroimaging and other severe mental illnesses, where the, the understanding is still in, in its infancy, I suppose, but the, the research activity is massive and the funding is massive. And coming across to work in neuropsychiatry, epilepsy, movement disorders, realizing that a lot of patients had functional neurological problems and functional seizures that was really not the case and so uh, with a lot of support of the Alfred Hospital and Monash University we've built up a pretty active clinic um, that works with the outpatients and inpatients of the epilepsy program where patients have functional seizures and we've developed some clinical programs that we're researching there um, and some other more basic research programs that we're really enjoying collaborating with our colleagues across the river with Sarah and others. Um, and a crucial part of that, like Sarah said, is, is building capacity. So um, I have two psychiatry advanced registrars at a time uh, who see patients and conduct therapy. And I have um, neuropsychology students as well who we have on rotation and um, help hope to raise awareness that they then go and spread off in their practice as well. Um, I really enjoy working both with the patients um, who I often find really inspiring despite um, how tough it can be, um, but especially also the kind of the burgeoning community of, of researchers and clinicians across the world uh, because we're, we're a steep part of the learning curve and that's a, an exciting place to be in. So um, it's, it's a, it's, really satisfying work. Sarah, I just would like to get some, it's more insight as you actually recognise as a leading international clinician and researcher, which is huge, um, for your um, expertise and treatment in cognitive and uh, emotional and social difficulties faced by individuals with neurological disorders. What are the difficulties that you have found the most common in FND patients? That's a really good question, and it's a hard question. Sorry. I guess for the very um, principal reason that FND is quite a heterogeneous or diverse disorder. So one of its hallmark, hallmark features is that it presents differently in different people, and even within a given individual, it can change over time. And I think that's one of the things that has really challenged the medical and broader health sector in coming up with appropriate diagnostic and treatment um, services because it does have this heterogeneity and this dynamic or changing nature. Um, so I guess if we take that as a starting point, 
we need to come to treatment and thinking about the challenges that people have really from a very open mind and being prepared to apply different techniques depending on what the presenting issue is. Having said that, we do find that all people, or in general, people with functional neurological disorders come in, first of all, having experienced quite a lot of stigma, which is pretty disappointing, uh, given that we're in 2023. Uh, but nonetheless, that's where we are um, because of that lack of awareness and because of that lack of understanding. And they've often taken a long time to reach us. So by the time they get to my clinic and are getting ready to engage in some longer term treatment, because that's what we really specialise in, um, they may have been diagnosed and had symptoms for 10 or 15 years. They may have been trialled through multiple different uh, inappropriate uh, drugs or other therapeutic interventions. And so the work where we start is by addressing that part of their journey. And they many of them share that, right? Um, and so we, we really need to increase the rate of appropriate assessment and referral for treatment. And that's something that we've been working hard on, Toby and myself and others in Victoria, to really improve this. But then from there, once we've kind of um, addressed and, and worked through some of that, then it comes down to the particular set of issues that might have made an individual more likely rather than less likely to develop FND. And there are a range of different what we call predisposing or prior factors that make that more or less likely. And then what are the precipitating events? What brought them you know, to presentation now or whenever that occurred? And then what are some of the things that might be maintaining those? And so often there might be in that predisposing area some initial trauma, early trauma or more recent trauma, but there can also be um, other kind of challenges that the individual has had to face in their growing up and their development, psychological or emotional challenges. Um, often the precipitating event is, is a significant life stress of some sort and it can be varied in what that is. And then the maintaining factors can be a variety of things, but they can be at a system level or they can be at a family level, or they can also be individual attributes to do with the person. So I know that's a bit general <laughs> um, and not really pinning it down to specific things, but, but that's the nature of the condition, that it is varied. But across those varying things, these are the types of features, I guess, that we see. We touched on the SPIN program. Uh, I would love to hear you explain that a little further and incorporating the sleep um, analysis that you do as well and also who can take part in this research. Okay, so the, the SPIN research program uh, commenced in 2019, actually a terrible time to commence a research program heading into COVID, uh, which I'm sure knocked a lot of us around. Um, and this program uh, comprises a very comprehensive assessment battery. It is general in nature, which has received a little bit of criticism, but the good thing about being very general in nature, it can go across many neurological conditions. So some of the things that we look at in the SPIN research program are people's cognition, um, their mood state, uh, their physical function, so balance, walking, dual tasking. Uh, we collect biological samples. Uh, we have a very comprehensive sleep assessment battery. So we look at sleep-wake behavior we're using wearable devices, questionnaires. And with this information, we basically formulate uh, profiles so they look like a sort of a similar to a pinwheel um, of sorts. And, and these profiles 
um, are provided to participants once finishing all the assessments. They're also provided to some of their, their some of their therapists, so whether it be their doctor or whether it be uh, allied healthcare specialists, uh, to help sort of guide any sort of treatment that they're doing, any sort of assessments they're doing. Uh, that's not designed to represent clinical assessments, but rather just provide a bit more information um, for anyone working uh, with with people living with uh, the neurological condition. Um, also provide information for people themselves. A lot of people are searching for information. And sometimes it's helpful. Um, there is a caution there that we always get people to speak to their therapists and, and their clinicians prior to trying to, to interpret a lot of this information that we provide back. It's available for people with FMD. Um, we're very fortunate to meet a very, very nice clinician in Perth, uh, Dr. Lei Kun Ko, who's, who's been doing some work over here for, for a long period of time. And she was kind of ecstatic that we were running this program because of the comprehensive assessment battery, which does take about a day, a day and a little bit to complete. And we, we've separated over multiple days. She was happy because it's um, it really suits the FMD community uh, because of the sort of the really broad heterogeneous presentation as, as Sarah mentioned um, and what we're doing really now is uh, we've made it more available online so we can't get all assessments out to people but um, we can assess people in various states um, we've actually even had a few people fly over from various states to to do our program which was really encouraging and uh, I suppose unusual to be honest in in some of the work that I've done previously so that was great, but it just it probably goes to show how much the F and D community actually want research at the moment. They're um you know they're wanting to really push it, and and uh, the good thing about this is we're leveraging on a lot of different expertise in the group and constantly forming collaborations because we you just can't get this work done, particularly in the F and D space without collaboration. It just doesn't it doesn't work, and um we hopefully we'll continue to get funding and we'll build these profiles over time and we're learning a lot at the moment as and as Sarah said people you know their symptoms can change throughout the day so this is something that we've learned a lot from you know with with people with F&D so it makes you know assessment really tricky and and capturing the experiences appropriately is so important as we progress towards interventions which is our ultimate goal so hopefully that gives you a really broad surface level overview of the SPIN research program, it's open and I, I can share details of this program and we're hopefully going to progress to some interventions coming up, but we're just very cautious that we don't want to jump the gun um, because we, we're unsure of the most sensitive measures um, and a lot of sort of the things that we would typically do. So light therapy with people, you know, might be contraindicated because of seizures Cognitive training might be contraindicated as well because of seizures. The exercise studies that we would normally do and I've done with people with Huntington's disease, you know, there's complications there. We just feel like we, as new players in this space, we need to understand F and D a little bit better. And 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 that's what we're doing and 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 reading up on a lot more sort of uh, research literature to get to that point of interventions. One thing I really um, admire with the SPIN program and including FND into it is that every single person involved happy to just engage in deep conversation about FND and, and a daily life of FND as well, which really is... I guess, heading for the interventions that they can put in place as well. But I have found the entire team amazing, as I do all research teams. But um, I've participated this. I've participated in this one, not being on the in the group or on the committee. So I'm a different role in this one. Yeah. <laughs> So heading to Toby, tell me what is involved more um, in the movement disorder research at Monash Neuroscience, and um, what do you, I'm really curious what you use the neuroimaging for with FND nowadays as well. Um, could you give us some insight into that? I um I think there's so much work to be done, and it, it um 
you know, it's exciting. You almost don't know where to start um, from using brain imaging tools through symptom profiling and communication of those profiles, like uh, the SPIN program, which sounds just fantastic, um, to therapy trials and how to tailor those and how to design services around those. So there's so much work to be done. Um, and it has to be collaborative because, um, because the nature of the different expertise required is, is pretty diverse too. Um, in the neuroimaging space, um, there's been quite a lot of uh, MRI-based studies, so structural and functional MRI studies, some of which we've contributed to, which is helping us understand perhaps some of the mechanisms for some types of FND. Um, and that's been really helpful, I think, in helping us move or update more of our models uh, psychologically, neuropsychologically, and um, and and um, in, in a brain sense about what might be happening for people. Um, and we are we're doing some um, structural scanning with people with functional seizures at the moment. We're we're doing a big collaborative study on that. Uh, we're collaborating with Richard and Sarah and others on a on a SPECT scanning study, which is very exciting. Um, and SPECT scanning is is excellent technology because it's hard to scan someone whilst they're having a seizure because they're moving, and it makes the images blurry. Uh, but with a with a SPECT tracer, you can inject someone with a small dose of radiation and it attaches to glucose, and it shows you a picture of the brain's metabolic functioning at the time of the seizure. So if blood is rushing, for example, to your, your fear centers in your brain and rushing away from the front part of your brain, your prefrontal cortex, away from those cognitive control centers, that might give us a clue that for that person in that seizure, it might have been like a, a panic without panic. This is one of our ideas about some of these seizures. Um, and so that's quite a logistical exercise, as you can imagine, because you have to be there with radioactivity in a syringe ready to inject someone the moment they have a seizure. So um, that's that's quite exciting work that we're, we're doing in a network of hospitals around Melbourne at the moment. Um, from a movement disorder point of view, um, FND often involves movements and it involves seizures and it involves cognition, it involves lots of different things as we've heard and it can be different in different people at different times. Uh, and that's a challenge for planning services. And, uh, and so, um, one of the um, developments at the Alfred is, is bringing more psychiatry and psychology into the movement disorders clinics. And so I've, I've now, I now work in the movement disorders team as well, where a significant amount of their work is with people with functional tics. And just like with epilepsy overlapping with functional seizures, functional tics can overlap with uh, so-called organic tic disorders. Um, and we can have... Um, development of relationships with different kinds of therapists as well. So we work very closely with specialist neurophysiotherapists and uh, OTs and speech pathologists for those kind of um, problems as well. And um, and we've started a, a um, multidisciplinary rehab-based team for, um, for patients with complex multi-domain sy system, uh, symptoms as well through the Epworth Hospital lately as well. Um, so I guess that the working from a neuroscience background that it can involve psychology, uh, neurology, brain imaging, uh, systems and service development factors is really something that we're, we're steadily, but um, slowly, but steadily developing. And I think the last point about that, D, and I, I obviously don't need to tell you, is, you this, is that involving um, people who, who live with FND or have got lived experience uh, is critical in all of that um, because it's it's such a diverse condition and it's such a, a difficult condition to capture and know what it's like from the outside. And I think um, designing services without that um, input is is likely to fail. And and similarly, designing research without that input, what do we need to know? And what You have quite a unique approach towards client care and you've written about this as well. Could you tell us a little bit about 
how you go about this? Sure. So I guess um, our approach has emerged over the years by working with people uh, very closely and it's fully informed by that. So what we call patient-centred um, or focused heavily based on what their needs are. So we don't have a formulaic program that says, all right, everybody gets this uh, set of, of things because we find that that's not really the best way to proceed with people. We need to tailor what we're doing with each individual, depending on that unique set of psychological, emotional, social and cognitive factors. So, um, you know, really our treatment is the long-term treatment we're providing for people. They might come through. So this speaks to this important area of what we're trying to build uh, statewide initially in Victoria, Toby and myself, Richard, others involved, where we have a better um, patient pathway for people. They come in, they can have appropriate assessment and diagnosis fairly rapidly, hopefully. And then depending on what we call their phenotyping, so that's their profiling of what their specific issues are, then working out what kind of treatment is best suited for them. And that might be an initial uh, eight-week course in cognitive behaviour therapy, or it might be some behavioural conditioning work, or it might be some psychoeducation. And for some people, that might be all they need and their symptoms will resolve and um, they don't need any further input. But for other people, that's the beginning of a really important journey. And I guess what we do in our clinic is we go on the journey with the person. It's their journey and we're kind of in the, the passenger seat is the best way of thinking about it. And it's a long haul flight. It's a long journey. It's not something that usually is done in, you know, a couple of sessions. And we make that commitment to people to go on that journey. And really what we're doing when they come to us is thinking about um, it's it's a bit like a tricky puzzle that we're solving and slowly to taking the different um, parts and piecing them together to make sense. And ultimately, the answer lies within the individual. We don't know a priori what it is that, you know, they're going to need. We discover that together as part of the therapeutic process. And it's a real puzzle. I, I find working with people with FND the most rewarding and stimulating work because it is this really collaborative thing. It doesn't happen without the collaboration. And it's, you know, surprising for everyone involved as we go as to what might emerge as core to their particular set of issues. It requires patience. It requires openness and humility. And, you know, we kind of learn from each other as we go in the journey. As I say, we don't necessarily know up front. That's a discovery process that we engage in. But then as we do engage in that discovery process, we know there might be particular types of therapeutic treatments that work well for that particular issue. So um, we'll then apply those different techniques depending on what's needed for that individual. So therapists, FND therapists, um, psychological therapists or psychotherapists need to be highly skilled. They need to be able to apply the relevant technique. And, you know, at a certain point in a patient's treatment, it might be that it's um, behavioural based work that's best going to help them with perhaps addressing some of those maintaining factors. Whereas at another point in their treatment, it might be um, deeper psychodynamic or interpersonal psychotherapeutic work that they need to really address some of those, you know, deeper psychological or trauma-based issues. There might be trauma exposure work that's needed. Um, there might be work around schema therapy um, for certain people. So it really depends. And that kind of um, reveals or un becomes clear as, as you work through treatment um, with the ultimate goal being to empower people with FND 
to be able to manage their own symptoms and prevent them, ideally, um, and to understand their condition and what is driving their actual set of symptoms and why they present the way they do, and then ultimately empower them to get on to live their best version of their life that they can um, and to set those goals with them as, as you move through treatment. Um, so hopefully we hope that the patients will will leave the clinic and, and go on and, and do that, and that's really our long-term mission. And when they do leave the clinic as such after however long they're needed to be in there, how often do you see a relapse and your patient coming back in? Well, it's quite variable. Um, it does occur, but it's it's not common with everyone. It's not like everyone has a relapse. Um, and a relapse might occur when there's a particular stressor that re-emerges in a person's life. So they may remain symptom-free for quite some time. And then maybe they've lost a job or something's not gone well in their personal relationships, or perhaps they've had some reactivation of traumatic memories for whatever reason, and they may re um, present back to the clinic in that setting. And then we might give them some booster sessions and engage them in a bit more um, treatment and do more therapeutic work with them, depending on what they need. But we do find that over time, people really do get that autonomy. And, and we know from the research that's already been done that Toby was talking about the neuroplasticity research in particular, that FND, a core aspect, is this um, autonomy or voluntary control, sense of voluntary control and sense of self that, you know, relates to that and that FND can um, erode that sense of voluntary control and autonomy because by its very nature it is the opposite to that right and people lose faith and trust in their bodies and what they're likely to do or not likely to do when they need them to do it so you know working on that and really um rebuilding those neuroplasticity pathways that support that is core and then once they get re-established that's you know you're you're off on the right track there but but in order to do that you kind of have to it's like layers of the onion move through a series of increasingly complex or deeper level issues to really get to the core of the problem and then um, you can start and if you like reprogram uh, the brain to work and think and behave differently uh, so it's it's not so much that we are cured instantly it's a it's a new functioning style and and way of life that you adapt and it's not until honestly it can take years to realize that as well uh, that um, life has has turned upside down but there is ways around it so thank you i appreciate exactly what you've just said specialised needs that people need. Um, where does that step in at your clinics? Then? Um, well, I was going to mention, I think that, um, and, and I'm aware that we were, we were to have a physiotherapist here, Sarah we Isaac, were. who's um, a real expert um, in developing local expertise. And, and, uh, and I guess I want to represent her a little because I work well right. and closely with with Sarah at the Epworth and um, and sometimes working on a physical level first uh, can be really effective. And I, I like the way Sarah phrased it 
in in reestablishing some reestablishing a little bit of faith in your body and relearning some of those automatic what were automatic body patterns say of walking or moving in a voluntary way um, can really set the ground for psychological work to get to those deeper layers of the onion so by having access to a physio and and or an ot or a, a sort of a physical based therapist if you like early on that can really um, establish some of that sense of knowledge and awareness about your body sometimes we find people are really unaware of their bodies and and doing some very basic work trying to re-establish that um, through i guess um, playing with things like movement and walking and using mirrors and and videos and different kind of things just to help people see themselves and their bodies differently or see them again how they did because i think it seems like once FNDs kind of started, uh, you undermine your your sense of your own trust in movement and awareness and voluntariness of movement, and that can become very sort of fraught and effortful and and full of a little bit of anxiety. And so, having physical therapy work together uh, is is critical. Um, and for some people, I think it, it can take some real time before some of the psychological um, aspects of FND even become apparent. And for some people, they just, they just aren't there, I don't think, or they're, they're not really easily discovered. And, um, and sometimes I find that can be really off-putting for people being told early on um, that this is down to stress or trauma or something when, when those things don't seem to be that relevant, or even if they were there, um, you know, they're a long way away or they, they still doesn't really make sense why you would start having seizures or your arm would stop working or something like that. So I think um, being able to draw on different therapist skills within a team uh, for a particular patient uh, and in different phases of therapy is really useful. Um, and it might be that as the phase of therapy progresses, some of that more psychologically oriented or insight driven work might um, be possible um, but um, but establishing a, a sort of renewed sense of communication say be between your mind and your body or or between your uh, your body and other people's bodies um, in your mind and other people's minds I think is is really crucial early on so um, it's great to be able to do that um, but we need to develop and help develop the skills and training and interest in those allied professions as well. So that's that's part of our hope, I think, as well, in, in Victoria at least and more nationally and internationally is to, to really uh, build FND training into physiotherapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, psychology, as well as the medical professions, obviously. And, um, and I think that is growing. I think particularly with younger doctors I see coming through, neurologists, psychiatrists and younger psychologists they just seem to be much more interested and the sort of relics of stigma seem to be uh withering away hopefully so um so there seems to be a lot more interest and and people are really seeing it um as the intriguing and sometimes very rewarding challenge that it can be very true and you actually answered my next question which was regarding students coming through what's in place now and where would we like to see the medical FND training moving? I can perhaps um, build on what Toby was um, talking about mm -hmm. in that the work that we're trying to do, we've put in a big submission 
um, to some of the government-based funding agencies to start and bring this new approach to thinking about FND in terms of assessment and treatment um, and to make that statewide. And part of that bid includes training. And I think what's most rewarding for all of us as um, clinicians is when we get to train with people from other disciplines. Um, of course, we like and need to train in our own disciplinary area, but um, we really get the most out of our work when we get to interact with all of the disciplines um, around the table. Um, this is the way we learn best and certainly it's the way that we do best treatment. I think this is well recognised in, in the field now. So we need to train the next generation with this interdisciplinary training framework in mind. And so as part of this bid, um, this is actually what we would hope to do. Um, so I've been kind of training registrars in neuropsychology and clinical psychology, but much better for them to, you know, interact with and um, and converse regularly with neuropsychiatry registrars and neurology registrars and physiotherapy trainees and OTs and speech trainees and the like. And so really FND, I think, is a, a, an opportunity for new models of healthcare more broadly across um, the sector and training of new generations. Because still, if we look at, you know, at the University of Melbourne, there's some interdisciplinary training that goes on, but we're talking about super clinics here, you know, where they're all together in the same clinic and they're all together in the same classes um, and they're really starting to share and understand their disciplinary perspectives and knowledge. So FND could be at the forefront of that um, mm -hmm. and that's actually really exciting. And, of course, in the middle of all of that is the person with FND and their carers and their family and their community. So it needs to include um, people with lived experience in those training environments as well. We need to have um, right from get-go students hearing about that and understanding that fundamentally and, and being, you know, um, taught by people with lived experience as to what is the right way to go about things and what is not the right way to go about things and how can they best work together. So I think this is a, a big opportunity that awaits us um, and that we need to do more on. I tend to agree and um, I am aware I've spoken with um, Richard regarding the the government work there and I do some government work here in WA as well so um, it's very similar as to what's happening uh, and I can see that we as as passionate um, advocates and researchers that FND is pushing forward with with uh, building awareness my last question to you, and I know we've sort of covered this, but on our ultimate, uh, I don't want to say dream, but an ultimate target, let's say, where would we like to see the awareness of FND? I'll jump in, take the easy answer, just on a level with other illnesses. I mean, it's it's not it's not that FND is particularly special. Uh, it's it's challenging and it's very challenging for the people living with it. But the awareness and the investment and the services and the research should just just need to be brought to a, an equivalent level to other similar chronic illnesses. Um, and I think that you know you don't have to dig very far to find pretty horrible comparisons with similarly um, prevalent or disabling or, or um, difficult conditions. Uh, I think that we thought in order to do that just in Melbourne we would probably need 50 times the increased level of services that we currently have was one calculation we had lately. So that, that's a modest sounding uh, goal, but it's pretty ambitious in terms of what, where we're coming from. And I guess I'd add to that we'd like a national, you know, we've been talking about services in Victoria. We've heard mm. about the great services in WA um, and we've got this problem with our system that help, 
hospital services are state-based and Medicare is national and it's a complex <laughs> health system. Um, but we want and need a national um, profile and set of services and pathways and consistent practice across the country. And there's no reason why we can't do that. And, and I think we need to work collectively towards that. And that's because what we're all on about is, you know, better, better care and better treatment for people with FND. Oh, I was just going to say one of the, one of the things that um, I think definitely needs to happen is you know that increased raising of awareness. You know, for FND, I, I think that a lot of the times researchers, uh, particularly clinicians that are outside of the FND space, don't really understand it that well. Um, and you know, we need to get a greater insight of what it's like to live with FND. And um, you know, there's some really great methodologies that are being practiced now. These days, you've got photo voice, you've got people taking photos of what it's like to live with a condition and then giving their experience. And I feel like a lot of that visual uh, aids are very empowering for the person. And I think they're very humbling for a lot of the researchers and, and the clinicians that don't quite understand. And I think that the more we do of these sorts of approaches, the, the greater the awareness will become. And I think the greater the awareness you, you get is you get the you get the more funding you know for services and you get the more funding for research and 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 I think that's what we should be pushing towards is to put it into the spotlight. So I mean that's that's probably the, one of the biggest things that I would add because you know when speaking with people, they talk about the daily struggles and and how it can vary throughout the day and and how people were perhaps didn't believe them and and I feel like these approaches may help in the future. We talk about state level, we talk about national level, and then we've got our international level where a lot of the studies that we're doing incorporate international leaders as well and um, a lot of overseas studies actually incorporate um, our Australian leaders as well. So we are learning constantly from all over the world and um, we are seeing progress. Um, but as as Travis just mentioned, on a on a scale of like a, J, a GP scale or a household name, uh, we are still floundering there. Which which would be as a patient, and I can speak for thousands of patients would be the ultimate goal. Yeah. Yeah. Has anyone any parting words or anything that we haven't touched on that you would like to mention? Well, just on the GP and um, broader um, system training, I think we do need increased awareness in accident and emergency departments and in mm. uh, the GP setting because we need the GP to be that critical link in helping connect all of the relevant services for an individual in their local community. So a lot of what we've been talking about today are these tertiary um, centre services through hospitals, and we need these specialist services. But ultimately, we, we want the person to be able to exist within their local community and have appropriate supports around them after they've received those services and and um, have that ongoing community-based support. So we need to do better linkages and, and grow better um, shared care models that allow GPs to play their crucial role, and that involves educating GPs about FND because, as you say, Dee, it's still pretty limited. Um, they may have had, you know, people will say to me, oh, my GP says, I've never come across this before, you know. I don't really know what this is. It's all a bit of a mystery to them. And also we know that if mm. people present in A&E departments, the ambulance might take them there. The ambulance drivers don't know what it is. 
the um, treating physicians on the front line don't know what it is, and that's where that's where all the trouble begins sometimes, mm. you know, for people. So it's, you know, it's a big job ahead of us. Um, all of these parts need to be um, grown and connected and um, to work better for, for people with FND. I was just going to add to that. I mean, I, I'm dismayed every time I hear that story that someone says, my GP has never heard of this or the nurse told me to get up or... Uh, you know some some dis, you know very discouraging story like that which still happens a lot of the time sadly but um some of the times i'm then encouraged because then the patient sometimes gives a very good education to that healthcare provider mm -hmm. and that's that's really what is a critical part of our network of education and if that healthcare provider gp nurse ambulance driver is open enough to learn um then that's probably the most effective teaching that they could have had so I think if if we can sort of leverage off that and the network of uh, patients with FND and their families and carers who can patiently teach their um, healthcare providers about FND, then that'll take us a long way, I think. You're exactly right there. We are always educating. I would like to thank you all for joining us today on our FND panel. Um, Professor Sarah Wilson, Dr. Toby Winton Brown, and Dr. Travis Crookshank, for your time and all that you're doing for everyone with FND, and not just the ones that you see, but the ones that are listening today and the people that come through in the future. So, thank you.